All right, iPhone 15 lineup, let's get pumped up. Let's figure out what our strengths are. iPhone 15 Ultra, what do you do? I'm the biggest, I'm the best, I'm the most expensive. That's right, and iPhone 15 Pro, what do you do? I'm the right size, the Ultra's too big, no one likes the Ultra. Yes, that's good, that's right. iPhone 15 Plus, what do you do? I make the pros look good. Yes, that's right, in regular iPhone 15, what do you do? I, uh... Uh, I don't- I don't know. I- I just- they got all those big cameras, they, they got those big screen- I- I don't know what I have! Come on, you've got something, regular iPhone 15. You gotta flex in some way, you gotta have a headlining feature, a one-word review! Um, uh, the- the, 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 the disappointment? No! You need something better than that! I know you can do better! The, uh, the, the lightest one? iPhone SE took that away from you. Come on, you can do this! What are your strengths? I don't know what I am! I'll tell you what you are, regular iPhone 15. I'll tell you. You are the starting price. Oh! Yeah, I, I guess I'm the cheapest of the, the most expensive iPhones. That's right, and you do cheap super well, and we're proud of you. <laughs> Thank you. I can't wait for people to actually buy me. No one's actually gonna buy you. It's mostly marketing purposes you exist. Oh. It's very easy to get caught up in what the latest and greatest next iPhone is gonna be. Especially following the iPhone 15 Ultra. A lot of crazy rumors going around. It's gonna have periscope lenses and titanium and redesigned chassis and all that. But it's very easy to overlook and not really discuss the regular iPhone 15 models, which are still rumored to come out next year. Both the 15 and a 15 Plus, despite the fact that the 14 Plus is not selling that well, Apple's not that quick to change up their lineup. So today, though, we're specifically referring to the entry level model that's probably going to keep that starting price of $799, which is really $829 if you're buying it unlocked. It's made of aluminum. That's not rumored to change. It's still going to be rocking a dual camera on the back. So, what changes are they actually going to bring to this entry level model? In my opinion, it should be pretty easy for Apple to make the iPhone 15 feel like a more noticeable major upgrade than the iPhone 14 because that was such an incredibly minor, very hard to recommend model, particularly when they're still selling the iPhone 13, which still has the A15 chip, still has the same notch, honestly has a lot of very similar camera features. There's basically no reason, in my opinion, for anybody to opt for the iPhone 14 over the 13, but with the iPhone 15 entering the picture, Ross Young, a supply chain analyst, says that Apple wants to expand on the dynamic island to bring it to the entire lineup. So even that $800 iPhone will be getting all of these animations, which I'm sure there will be a lot more software support by next year as well, because all of the developers are getting pretty creative with their dynamic island capability on the 14 Pro series this year. So no more notches, essentially, on the iPhone 15 lineup, which I guess some people may look at as a win. Others will look at as a downside if you prefer having the static peninsula. But I consider any design change that you can visibly see from from just the very front of the phone a pretty big upgrade because it's honestly very rare these days that you can tell a newer iPhone from last year's model just by looking at the front. Usually you have to look at the camera arrangement on the back or you have to, you know, boost the brightness settings a little bit. So the fact that you'll just be able to walk up to the iPhone 15 and know, yep, that's definitely not a 14 because there's no more notch. To me, that makes it slightly more noticeable and slightly more appreciated than that very slow iPhone 13 to 14 upgrade. The other good news is that since we got that awkward mid-year with the iPhone 14s, keeping the A15 chip around, just with one more GPU core and a little bit extra RAM. That means moving on forward, the Pros should continue to get the latest in the A-series silicon, so 15 Pro, 15 Ultra, they'll get the A17 chip, but the iPhone 15 should be getting the A16 chip, which obviously everybody that's going to be buying the regular iPhone 15, they're probably not coming from a 14 Pro, so A16 chip is definitely definitely going to be an upgrade even if you're coming from an iPhone 13 series. So now from here on out every year there should be a newer number CPU and GPU inside the cheap iPhones and the expensive iPhones. And we know from the performance tests of the A16 chip that uh, it's not that much faster than the A15, but it should be a bit more power efficient. I don't think that necessarily means battery life is going to be better, but probably the biggest change that we're going to be talking about with the entire iPhone 15 lineup that is rumored to come to even the entry-level iPhone 15 is USB-C. The downside and most disappointing thing about this, though, is Ming-Chi Kuo has been alluding to the idea that USB-C on the 
entry-level iPhone is still gonna have the same data speed capability of Lightning. So USB 2.0, basically the same type of USB-C port they used on the iPad 10. That feels awfully petty, especially when, if you look it up, a lot of cheaper Android phones with USB-C at least have USB 3.0 speeds. A lot of the higher-end Androids can go over that, but it'll definitely be one of those phone models that just ticks off the tech community. It just annoys everybody that it exists, and they're like, how could Apple do this? How do they think they can get away with this? And then Apple gets away with it because average consumers don't care. For someone that just wants to buy, like, the newest iPhone because it has the highest number, 15, but they're not really a nerd like we are, if you're watching this video, they're not gonna care about things like the transfer speed of the data port. They're not gonna care too much about the camera design on the back or what the chassis is made of. They're just looking for a phone. And, like, 99% of the time that a port is used on an iPhone, it's for power. It's not necessarily for data. So, we don't know quite yet if Apple's going to adopt faster charging across the entire lineup. So far, no analysts or leakers have claimed that, but USB-C definitely enables a lot more overhead. And I think the main reason everybody wants USB-C is for port symmetry. To have one cable that can charge your iPad, your MacBook, and your phone. And ultimately, that, I think, is the biggest win. So many people have USB-C cables in their house already. So, yes, even if USB 2.0 makes it to the iPhone 15, I still consider that better than Lightning. But in my opinion, by far, the most disappointing thing about the iPhone 15, and yes, the 15 Plus as well, is according to Ross Young, who's expecting the Dynamic Island to become a standard, he's saying Apple is not going to be ready to switch the entire new iPhone lineup over to LTPO OLED panels, which basically means OLED panels that can dynamically change their refresh rate depending on what's going on with the display, which does indeed mean, yes, that Apple, of all companies, is gonna feel brave enough to, at the end of 2023, release an $800 and $900 phone that still has a 60 hertz display. That's right, sorry, ProMotion is not rumored to be coming to the cheaper iPhones, not even 90 hertz. I know I keep seeing everybody suggest that middle ground. Why don't they just cut it to 90? It's a nice little compromise. It's a supply chain thing, guys. Like, this is ultimately up to how many OLED panels Apple can get from Samsung, LG, and BOE, all of which are pretty tapped out in how many displays they can build. Apple's already having a hard time keeping up with production on the 14 Pros, so bringing it to the even cheaper iPhones means having to mass produce even more of these very expensive but very good display panels, and while that is disappointing to the tech community and pretty much all YouTubers are probably gonna say, don't buy the 15, don't buy the 15 Plus, including myself, I'm not different. I do think that ultimately average consumers aren't gonna care, but an average consumer might notice something a lot more like Dynamic Island. It's not gonna stand out as like a major redesign like the iPhone 10 was, but it is a noticeable UI element that basically impacts the entire usage of the device. There's all kinds of apps and, you know, face ID animations, ringer switches, charging animations, airdrop notifications that essentially all change with that Dynamic Island, and I bet iOS 17 is probably gonna change a bunch of functionality with the Island 2. That's probably gonna be, like, the headlining feature. That's going to be what captures everyone's attention. They're not gonna be thinking about ProMotion or 90 hertz or 60 hertz. And I think that a lot of people online see Samsung or Google come up with something or sell Android phones for really cheap that have 120 hertz, and they go, why can't Apple do that? But they don't realize Apple is building in the volume of, like, tens of millions of units per month. And none of these other Android phones that you're describing are being built at the same volume as the iPhone is. And that's pretty much one of the sole reasons that Apple tends to be late with a lot of technologies is that they have to wait until they can implement it on an extreme scale that other Android phones don't have to. So while I definitely expect the iPhone 15 to be a big tech spec disappointment to the tech community, I do think that this will be a more noticeable, more appreciated upgrade than the iPhone 14 was, just because it shared so much in common with the iPhone 13. This should be at least a little bit more noticeable, and of course it's Apple. They always bake in a handful of new camera features. Hopefully they bring macro mode to the cheaper iPhones as well, but since they're gonna have that 60 hertz display that doesn't have the variable refresh rate changes, that also means no always on display on the regular iPhones. That's gonna remain a pro feature. And if Apple comes up with some fancy new use case for Thunderbolt on the iPhone where they're bragging about how the pros and the ultras can dock into Apple Dex mode and support stage manager or Mac OS or something, obviously those types of features aren't gonna be on the cheaper iPhone because they're gonna be limited by those slow USB 2 speeds. I'm just hoping that because the iPhone 15 
sounds like such a minor-ish, but better than last year upgrade that Apple doesn't increase the prices. But frankly, I feel like we got lucky this year with no price hikes because overseas, the prices went up a lot and inflation has been in full swing for a long time. So Apple could have easily raised prices across the entire lineup if they wanted to. 2023 might be the year that they pull the trigger on that. But considering that it's rumored to have, you know, pretty similar designs to the iPhone 14 and iPhone 13, and that includes the iPhone 12, I think they should keep the prices the same, and if anything, maybe drop them. I'm sure none of you will disagree with that, but what are you most looking forward to in, not the Pros or the Ultras, but how do you think Apple should handle the regular iPhone 15s? Should they keep pushing the decoy effect and just try to convince you to get the Pro in the Ultra because those are so much better? Or do you think there's a reason to have a compelling option that's, you know, better than last year's model, but not as good as the Pro? What are the best specs and best features we can have at that $800 price point? All that good stuff, let me know your thoughts down in the comments below. And thank you to everybody on Talos of Tech Pro supporting this channel directly. Seriously, helps me out a ton, as does just watching these videos. So thanks again for watching. This is your Apple Sheep here. I'll see you all in the next one.